Well, and welcome once again to Unstoppable Mindset. Today, we get to interview Ali Ingersoll, who is a corporate day DEI strategies consultant, MS or Ms. Wheelchair America 2023. Wow. She's a keynote public speaker, a writer, and even a financial assets trader, trader that you are. Anyway, Allie, welcome to Unstoppable Mindset. How are you? Michael, thank you. It's so great to be here. Happy to happy to have a chat long overdue. <laughs> Yeah, we've been working at it a while, haven't we? We have. Well, the best thing, my dad always said he likes a job that starts hard. So there you go. So what is a financial assets trader? What the heck? We'll start with that. Oh, uh, well, um, day trading. Um, I'm 27. After working in politics, I learned um, technical analysis day trading um, through a program called Drummond Geometry. And it's basically laying multiple time frames over one another. And you can use it for stocks, bonds. Um, Forex, uh, futures, yeah, sky's the limit. It's that's the simplified version. <laughs> and so you do that for four people or what? No, no, I just do that for myself, and you then do I, I do that part time now. And I switched careers a handful of years ago into the world of uh, disability uh, strategy consulting, working for a handful of beautiful organizations and disability inclusive hiring practices, and helping coach employee resource groups, and fighting for legislation and disability and so much more. I'm like the Energizer Bunny on Wheels 2.0. <laughs> there you go. So what is your main day job today? Um, I have multiple day jobs. I work for a hand as a consultant. I work with Open Inclusion half of my week, which is a beautiful, inclusive research um, design organization where we work with large corporate brands to help them make product services and digital environments more accessible um, through high quality qualitative research. And so I run their global community of people around um, the world, which is a really beautiful uh, organization in the pan disability community. I work for a handful of organizations where I help coach their employee resource groups, um, all kinds of disability resource groups. And then I do, I travel around the country and I do keynote speaking on purpose and life and health insurance and advocacy. Um, and that's my professional and my advocacy life. I fight health insurance companies for health equity to get people the uh, medically necessary equipment they need to not only survive in life, but to thrive. But I have a beautiful coalition of incredible people and networks and organizations. So nothing I do is alone. It's always a team effort with the ultimate mission of paying it forward, human kindness, empathy, and um, really helping people understand that disability is that one club that doesn't discriminate. Any one of us can join it for any reason. I hope you don't, but if you do, it behooves all of us in society and corporations and just being a decent human being to pay attention to these issues for those that move, think, sense um, um, differently and gee, communicate differently. Gee, can't you find something to do in your free time? <laughs> I volunteer on a lot of nonprofit boards. <laughs> there you go. Well, it really is a pleasure to have you here. And of course, we met through Josh and, and Accessibility, which is kind of fun. Yes. And uh, so I really enjoy that. So tell me a little bit about Ali growing up, you know, the early Ali and all that. Kind of love to see oh, wow. how you got where you are. And might as well go back to the beginning, as they say. Yeah, I will give you an abbreviated version. Um, home base in life was always a very out island in the Bahamas. Um, uh, my parents started building a place there in the 70s before I was even a thought in their mind. And so I always grew up as a beach bum girl and uh, having two older brothers and everyone wanting us to be too girly. And I went to boarding school at a very young age, at 10, uh, with a lot of Catholic nuns. I grew up all around the world. My mom is German. My dad is English-American. So I had the beautiful opportunity to travel the world um, quite a lot. And I engaged in a lot of wilderness survival programs. Basically, what that means is I voluntarily kicked my own butt to um, sweat it out in the middle of the Australian outback, <laughs> hiking for hundreds of miles with an 80 pound pack. I don't know what I was thinking, I don't um, but it taught, it taught me a lot of really great leadership skills and endurance and resilience and grit essentially. And then at 16, um, 17, I graduated high school at a young age and I moved over to China for no good reason. Then I was stubborn and I didn't want to go to university yet. And over there, I lived and I worked. Um, I went to jail over there for a while. I dated an Italian kickboxing instructor who didn't speak English. I didn't speak Italian. So I learned Chinese very quickly. 
Uh, I was finally dragged back um, to the United States to go to college uh, where I majored in entrepreneurship and I got a degree in business administration um, from the University of Miami where I started working with the Rockefeller family uh, and I opened up a nonprofit organization that got young people in underrepresented and underserved communities active in the civic engagement process. So it was a beautiful use of my entrepreneurship degree. Um, I'd like to say I knew what I was doing, but I was 23. So I had no idea. I made it up as I went along. It seemed to work quite well at the time. (laughs) And then I got slightly jaded by politics. And that's when I moved back home to the Bahamas um, when I was 25, 26 and started to learn day trading. And in, in August 2010 at 27, I took a shallow water dive and broke my neck, leaving me a C6 quadriplegic and basically spent the next seven years, six and a half, seven years in and out of hospitals with every medical complication you could probably think of. The names might, might are a little daunting. And so I uh, was still working um, full time, but very lonely existence, no disability community. And moved back to China for spinal surgery and spent a couple of years over there, which is that story would take up a few hours. And I moved back to Raleigh in 2015-16 uh, and spent a whole year in bed with a stage four pressure sore on my backside, which is how I really got into disability advocacy, really fighting health insurance for medically necessary equipment and took that work um, nationally and worked with a lot of beautiful organizations and that won me the title of Miss Wheelchair America 2023, which I'm about to pass off the title this week to the new title holder. The competition is going on at the moment. And um, and about three or four years ago, dove into the uh, corporate world of diversity, equity, and inclusion and absolutely love it. I get to meet cool people with the same shared mission and purpose and passion. And that's what keeps me going despite all the secondary complications that are mostly unseen, actually. The, being paralyzed is easy. You know, I get to drive a wheelchair. There's so much behind the scenes and under the hood that actually affects your daily quality of life. Yeah. Yeah. And driving a wheelchair with a C6 issue is a whole lot different than being a para and being able to, to push wheels. And my well, wife- you know, I, yeah, I couldn't drive my wheelchair for the first couple of months. I broke my toe. I ran over people and I cried to my mom. And I said, well, <laughs> how am I going to be paralyzed if I can't drive the wheelchair? <laughs> well, I remember, uh, so my wife was a T3 para. And so she um, did well with a manual chair until like 2002 when shoulders mm-hmm. started to give out. And as her doctor, ah, yes. as her physical medicine doctor said, you know, the shoulders don't come with a lifetime warranty. So she graduated to a power chair. And I remember her starting to get used to driving a power chair and, and had some some challenges. Remember the old song, um, she'll have fun, fun, fun till her daddy takes the T-bird away. Oh, a great song. So I love we, all these. So my uh, my wife's best friend, Linda, and I created the song, She'll Have Fun, Fun, Fun Till We All Take the Joystick Away. She was, oh, yes. She was a little dangerous for a while. We were in a, ah. um, she, she was in a restaurant um, first day driving the chair and actually hit a table and almost knocked it over, among other things. So, But she got better at it. Well, I still have plastic rails on the sides of my walls, even now, 13 years later, because there's just that moment when I'm zipping around the corner. I'm like, oh, gosh, I'm the one that has to pay for it as a homeowner. So let me be careful. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, we we haven't we never did do that. Um, Karen passed away this last uh, uh, November. I'm sorry to hear that. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Well, we were married 40 years. So as I tell people, no matter what anyone says, she's up there monitoring. And if I misbehave, I'm going to hear about it. So Oh, absolutely. Got to be a good kid. But, you know, um, it it is um, in, in a lot of ways, and it is appropriate to not necessarily think of it in a negative situation. But I think it was awesome. And I think that she did well with it. Um, she liked the person she was. She was good in her own skin. And that's as much as anybody can ask for. I couldn't agree more on this. A beautiful, it's a beautiful sentiment. So she, uh, she, she did well, but I think she, she had a pretty bad sore last July, um, July of 2022. Pressure sores are no joke. Oh no, my gosh. And it, um, 
she eventually had to go to the hospital and was in for a month. And I think that kind of started the eventual slide, if you will, because she also had mm -hmm. rheumatoid arthritis and she couldn't take uh, the normal infusion for RA uh, while she was getting rid of the, the sore because the infection would have been right, more likely to come back. So yeah, it was, it was a problem. So it's just one of those things and got to accept it. So we such did. Such is and, life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, such is life. Absolutely. You adapt, you overcome, and you adjust. You have to absolutely. reimagine. You have to adapt to the unknown every day. Yeah, I wish more people really understood that. You know, we all hear about how oh, change is all around us and all that, but the reality is, the other side that people say is, "I hate change. I don't want to change. I don't want things to be different." Well, it doesn't work that way, folks. Nope that that is just life. But sometimes you hear one, even when I'm on stage, I. If I can affect one person's yeah. change in perspective or purpose, just one, that is a huge win for me. It's never about me when I get up on stage. It's just giving, sometimes I'll listen to a, an audible book and I will think, say to myself, wow, that one sentence. Yeah. And then it just takes me on this incredible tangent. And I'm like, yes. Yeah. So, you know, it only takes one person, whether you're reading a line of a book or you hear them on stage or you listen to them on audiobook, whatever it may be. Yeah, and that's what I've always felt. If I can change one person's perceptions, I've done my job. And Agreed. That's that's as good as it gets. And when you get a whole bunch of people who in it, who who really change, and you know that they've changed because of the way they behave and act going forward, then you know you've really accomplished something, which is so cool. Agreed. Well, what is your favorite childhood memory? You must have some good memories growing up. You remember them anyway. One of my favorite childhood memories is growing up on a very island in the Bahamas, and we were all over the place around the globe. We would come together at Christmas, and we had um, a powerboat, a 33-foot powerboat, and there were six of us in my immediate family at the time. And we would go on these Robinson Crusoe um, camping trips. Mm -hmm. We would pick a, a leather 700 islands in the Bahamas. Most of them are unpopulated. And we would pick a location and we would set up campsite during Christmas. And my mom would get battery operated lights around a little, like a little casarina, like palm tree and bring these wrapped presents. We would go spearfishing for our food and build sand castles and get bitten by scorpions while building fires and read jokes around the fire at nighttime. And it was just the most incredible family time. And it's so unusual. And I just attribute all of that to just having, I feel blessed to have such incredible parents. Yeah, being bitten by a scorpion is no fun. Well, fortunately, in the Bahamas, most things are not poisonous. They hurt. You swell up, but you're not going to die. Yeah. <laughs> you, may, you may swear a little bit. But. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I have not been even though I live on the desert and lived on the desert most a uh, good part of my life, but I just assume not. It's okay. I've been close to black widows and uh, my brother-in-law, when he was growing up, actually caught a black widow and just held it in his hand and took it in and showed his parents and said, see what I got. And, and everybody was going, oh my God, will you get rid of that? Drop it. You're going to get bit. It was, he was an amazing guy and he, and he still is. He's a a very adventurous oh, sort of person. Yeah. I've been close to them, but I've I've not been bit and, and would rather not be, as I say. It's okay. Yes. <laughs> I think there are always experiences to have, and I don't need to have that one to understand it. So that's okay. Well, so you lived in China, and what did you learn from living in China? Wow. So many lessons. It actually taught me this incredible lesson in humility and diversity and culture in that I saw such atrocities uh, mm. in China at a very young age that by the time I went to university, I didn't, I couldn't connect with anyone my age anymore at fraternity parties and sororities and that college life because I saw children whose hands had been cut off on purpose when they were children, when they were babies, to be better beggars. I saw people, someone that was shot in the street. I went to jail in a northern Mongolian um, uh, city called Harbin, right right on the border of China. It was an ice city. I, I didn't do anything illegal. I just forgot my passport. I couldn't pay the hotel bill, but it was really the Italian boyfriend's fault, not mine. <laughs> but I was in jail with these women and I called my mom with two minutes left on my phone call, my phone card, mom. Remember, this is in 2000. So I, right. there were phone cards, right? In the old Nokia cell phones. <laughs> and I said, mom, I love you. I'm going to jail. If you don't hear from me in a week, call the state department, but give me a chance to get out. 
And I was in jail with these women in freezing temperatures. And I was, I, I understood China, I, you know, I speak Chinese and I listened to their stories and there's no due process in China in a communist country. Mm-hmm. And many of them had been in jail for years. So I had such a drastic perspective and the change in the way I saw people. Um, and it profoundly impacted me to this day. I think it's interesting. I've talked to a number of people who've had the opportunity to travel to a number of different countries and I have as well. I haven't seen the atrocities that that you have, but it is so wonderful to travel to different countries and see how they live, how they behave, listen to their broadcasts and and listen to their attitudes. Um, And, you know, even in this country, it is so different going from, say, the West Coast to the East Coast. There are so many atrocities right here in our backyard as well. There are. There are. Um, and we don't deal, for example, with disabilities very well, which is so unfortunate. And, and yeah, nobody- I, w- I was on a world, I was on a um, a global world forum for disabilities. It was a webinar and uh, there's some folks in Africa, some paraplegics, and I was explaining Medicare, Medicare, Medicare and Medicaid in the systems and how you have to fight for the number of catheters you get as an example, as a someone um, who uses full-time catheters. And they said that's really interesting. I didn't know that perspective. I thought America was the man of the land of milk and honey for yeah. health insurance. I'm like, ah, it's probably better than Africa where you are, but, but you know, still. it's different perspectives. Well, and of course, we still face overall as people with some disabilities, and I'll explain that in a second, but an unemployment rate among employable people still of in the 65 to mm-hmm. 70% range. And there's no reason for that today. Agreed. Mm-hmm. But, but it's what they do. And I say some disabilities because, and I've said it on this podcast a number of times, I believe everyone has a disability and the disability that most people have is they're light dependent. Why isn't, mm-hmm. uh, isn't that something that we consider a disability? Because ever since the electric light bulb was invented, the fact is we've spent a lot of money, a lot of time, and a lot of thought to make lights available on demand. So mostly sighted mm-hmm. people's disability is covered up, but the reality is as soon as the power goes out, the disability rears its head again. So the fact is everyone has a disability, whether we like to I believe couldn't it or not. I couldn't agree more, right? Yep. Yeah. And so it is an even issue Even seasonal to depression, even seasonal anxiety, that's a disability, temporary or not. Yeah. I know it didn't bother me so much, but it did at Karen when we were in New Jersey. We had some times that was really cloudy in the spring and so on. And she she got depressed by it and acknowledged it and worked through it. But still, um, it's one of the things that you got to understand. It's different different things for different people, but it doesn't mean we shouldn't understand them and deal with them. Couldn't agree more. Well, sp- so, well said. So you have um, so you went to university. Where did you go? I spent two years in Los Angeles uh, in Occidental, small liberal arts college, oh. majoring in economics. I, um, well, I'm not sure if I should say this on a podcast, but I'm going to anyway. I um, got in way too much trouble and lived at the Playboy Mansion for a while. Ah, there you go. And I, I realized this is probably not the best way to go in life. So I transferred to South Beach because that's so much better. Okay. <laughs> to the University of Miami, but I did take, I was taking life seriously and the University of Miami has this incredible entrepreneurship program with this amazing business plan competition. It was my dream to win it. Um, and I transferred over there full force um, and just really focused on school cool. and, and every so, opportunity. So what was your degree in finally? Entrepreneurship, actually. How to start and run a business. Mm-hmm. Cool. So did you out of college then go do that or what did you do? Um, Yes. So after winning, I did win the business plan competition with my partner. So that was exciting. But we did think I thought I was on top of the world. I thought a job was just going to come to me and I was an amazing rock star. (laughs) Yeah, not at 22. Nobody's a rock star at 22. (laughs) And so I didn't know I was kind of living off the money. I know I was living off the money I'd won. And my first job out of college was uh, lasted 24 hours. It was for a pyramid scheme selling office supplies. Oh. And I really got hung in. I, and after the first day, I was like, oh, God, what happened? And so I floundered around for a bit. And then my name got passed around through some friends in the political fundraising world to Justin Rockefeller of the Rockefeller family, who's a lovely human being. 
And he was with his partner, was starting a civic engagement nonprofit called Generation Engage. And they were opening up multiple locations around the country. And they asked me if they, I would like to open up the Florida chapter. And I said, yes, that would be amazing. I got to put my fundraising skills, political skills, networking, community building skills, no idea what I was doing, made it up every single day, but it seemed to work well. <laughs> so how, what did you do after that? Or how long did you do that? I did that a handful of years up until I was 26. Um, and then I just got jaded by politicians a little bit in the political process, to be completely honest. And I wanted to find a profession that I could be independent and figure out how to help other people. And my dad suggested be a day trader, put yourself through a 12,000 page course. I will help you with macroeconomic discussions, but you've got to do the work, kid. And I said, I can do that. And so I moved back to the Bahamas. I helped take care of the property there in exchange for, you know, room and board. <laughs> and I really, I mean, it was wonderful. Life was perfect. I couldn't, I remember saying to my mom on the day I broke my neck that I wouldn't change one thing about my life, mom. It's so perfect. And then 10 minutes later, took mm -hmm. that dive. <laughs> and so do you still think you wouldn't trade anything? Uh, Your life? Well, you know, it's, you know, it's a really good question. It's one of those what if questions. Yeah, I can't change it. I don't think like that. I yeah. don't think, well, if I could trade this, you know, if I could have my hands or would I rather have where my feet? I mean, it is what it is. It was an accident. I never harbored anger or resentment. This is a life I've been given. Um, I've always had a quirky, dark humor sense of attitude with loving to build people up and loving to help people. It just took me a long time to figure out how to do that because I quite literally was in medical survival mode for seven straight years. So I didn't have the ability to do that. Um, so I have a very analytical, strategic mind when I was just living from crises to crises to crises. And um, I, I feel like I make the most of what I can. And you know, the, mo the the biggest thing that gets me is chronic pain. It's like burning pins and needles from the mm. chest down in my arms. And I combat that with probably overworking, um, but helping people, mentoring people and uh, meditating. And meditating and taking that personal time is always a very helpful and useful thing to do. I'm trying to draw more boundaries in my life and figure out how to do that. I'm not brilliant at it, but I work very hard at it. You know, but you're, you're accomplishing a lot and you you sound very comfortable in what you do. And I agree with you. You can deal with what if all day long, but the bottom line is you don't have any control over that. What you do have control over is well, how you deal here, with it. Here's the thing. Um, many of us have died multiple times with significant disabilities. At the end of the day, whenever my life comes and I'm very comfortable with death, um, I want to not, I don't want to think about necessarily how hard I worked, but whose lives I've affected, how I've affected their lives. And if I could be so blessed and lucky to, when I'm gone, that one person takes something I said and it changes their life or impacts them in some way, or they spread that message to their child or their friend or someone in the future, that's a legacy I'm comfortable with, even mm -hmm. if I'm gone tomorrow. Yeah. I, I know exactly what you're saying. I was blown away earlier this year. I did a speech in 2014 in Washoe County, Nevada. It was a mm -hmm. safety and emergency preparedness oh, yes. talk. Mm -hmm. And earlier this year, one of the audience attendees wrote an article about my speech and what I said and Amazing. published it. Oh my god. Nine gosh. years I, later. Michael, wow. And and he and he said all what I would think are the right things and so on. But that's incredible. And as as I said, if, if I can influence one person, I've done my job and I I'm very happy with that. So and and I and I know there have been other times that that at least I've had the the blessing of learning that that people did discover something from what I said. So that's pretty cool. So I understand exactly what you're saying. And you know. Whatever is going to happen is going to happen. I couldn't agree more. I, you know, I used to fake it till I made it, right? And then I turned that into fake it till you become it. And I really did become the quirky quad dark humor enthusiast. And then I've since changed that in the last year to face it till you ace it. And I, I truly authentically know that and believe that about myself. And you can't do better than that. I mean, that makes perfect I can, sense. Yep. Mm -hmm. That's really cool. Well, even through all that, um, what's what's probably the biggest failure or biggest thing that you've ever had to face in your life? 
oh my gosh, I fail 80% of the time. People, <laughs> people think I succeed. They're like, wow, you're doing so much. It's because I throw a lot at the wall and maybe 20% well, no of that. you have those plastic or, rails. I know, or maybe 10% works out. Um, but I, I literally, I do, I feel all the time from professional and personal things I go through, but because I have so many things, um, in the works that when one thing doesn't work out, I just, I don't know if I'm genetically wired this way, but I'm like, okay, that didn't work out. Bummer. I'm going to move on to the next thing. But I think that might just be me. <laughs> yeah. Well, well. You're wired as you're wired, and, I'm, and as long as you deal with it and learn from it. I mean, we forward. could spend an hour listing off my failures, but I mean, those are the lessons I've taken from the failures. Well, and I still am a firm believer in failure is such a, a horrible word to use because it's really a learning opportunity. And you well, fail, I, you live, learn. I live by the Winston Churchill quote. I repeat it every morning to myself that success consists of moving from failure to failure without lack of enthusiasm. Yeah. Yeah, you know, because the, what are the failures? They're just learning opportunities. And so it didn't work mm -hmm. out like you wanted. What do you do about it? What do you learn from it? And that's really what it should be. Exactly. So you, you learn, you go forward, and you go from there. Well, so given everything that's happened in your life, if you had a chance to go back and talk to your younger self, what would you teach her? God, that's a really... Or at least advise her whether she wants to learn it or not. But what would you advise her? Um, what would I advise? You know what? It's a really profound question. There's only one piece of advice I would give myself. I have this philosophy, whether one agrees with it or not is different. I work hard and I play hard. So mm -hmm. I do things oftentimes for the story. It's not always a great idea. So sometimes I just came back from Costa Rica and I did some fun, wild, um, wacky adventures. I may not have been the safest, but I said, you know what? I'm it's the safest to that I've planned for and whatever's going to happen is going to happen. The only piece of advice I would give myself is I would say after college, I would have taken and, and during the last semester, taken more opportunities to network and build um, a network of great human beings to have helped me earlier on in life because I mentor and help a lot of new people. And I think it's really important to have a professional mentor. And I did not have that. I did not build that. I didn't put that effort forward. And so after college for a good six or seven months, I floundered and I had no purpose and I didn't know where I was going. And people think, well, the America, there's so many opportunities. And I think that sometimes is a really big problem and challenge for young people because there are so many choices and you don't know where to go. And that that's probably the only thing I would change, honestly, not even my experiences that I will keep private from the Playboy mention, not even those I would change. <laughs> Well, that's all part of what your life was, right? It was, exactly. And so, you you know, if you could change them, then you wouldn't be the same you that you are. Precisely. I couldn't agree more. So, that that's okay. So, you know, but you do a lot. Um, you are a quadriplegic and so on. So, how do you how do you do what you do during the day? What, you know, like what is your morning routine like? How do you? I am get regimented up and going and like all a military. I'm, I'm a military like I'm a like I'm a regimented military sergeant in my own life. But when I do have playtime, even if it's only for eight hours or five hours, whatever happens in those five hours, I will go to the moon and back. It doesn't matter. But when I'm in my serious work mode, I wake up every morning at five a.m. Caregivers come in as a quadriplegic. They help me with bowel and bladder and getting dressed. And then I exercise 60 to 90 minutes every morning, five days a week, no matter what, at a home gym I have. And then I get up to my screens at about 7 or 7.30 in the morning. I work all day unless I have a doctor's appointment or I'm traveling or whatever that may be. And um, around 3.30 or 4 every single day, um, due to so much cervical neck pain and other pains I have from surgeries, I actually work with my caregivers again, do more exercise or take a shower or whatever it might be. And then I work um, in my bed, which is a total hospital electrical bed and a queen size. It's mm. very cool one. It just looks like a normal bed. And I work from a laptop in my bed because that my body needs that um, mm. from my pain perspective. And then I'll work until late. I just have to switch positions. So Monday through Friday, I'm pretty regimented about that. And I don't change that. 
And I don't know um, if people are going to like me or not after they hear this, but I have the opposite problem of ADD where I have this intense focus. And I think I'm genetically wired like that, where when I get in front of the screen or I'm writing an article, I'm working on a project or working for a client, I can just sit there and I just won't move until it's done. Yeah. You know, I had a job for several years in San Diego County in, in Vista, California. Well, actually, it was in Carlsbad. Mm-hmm. And what I loved about the job was I was first into the company every day. I was in by six selling to the East Coast. And I loved the fact that I had the building to myself. And even after people started arriving, I ignored people, wasn't very sociable until at least after nine because I was busy doing what I needed to do. And even then, I worked at staying very focused. I understand exactly what you're saying. When you've got a job to do, you got to do the job. Well, that's it too. I'm actually listening to this book right now called The One Thing. I'm trying to strategically design my life a little bit in a more streamlined way for 2024. And they were just talking this morning on this chapter about like cutting out four hours of your day uninterrupted, no matter what to focus on whatever it is, that one thing that you really want to focus on. And I was listening to it. I'm like, wow, I do that. I've I've done that forever. I already do that. And it really does help. And that creates a habit. And through that habit, that creates a routine and it just becomes part of you. Well, and you, you spend time thinking, and I'm sure that there is time during every day that you spend time analyzing what you do or how the day went. And then What do you do different tomorrow or how could you improve whatever you were doing? Absolutely. Yeah. Well, you're a a constant iterative process of life, right? Absolutely. And Um, that's why people with disabilities are some of the most creative problem solvers on the planet because we literally sometimes have no idea what's going to hit us in the morning when we wake up or in the middle of the night for that matter. Right. And so you, again, you also learn to accept a lot. Uh, i heard somebody who did a survey and did a study of blind people using the internet as opposed to sighted people. And he said that blind people tended to be more patient with internet websites because a lot of the times they're mostly not accessible. So we kind of learn how to muddle through, but we all can take advantage of some of those things and, and become better and stronger, but we look for everything to be handed to us and that doesn't help. No, but I mean, I've learned just through my disability, infinite patience. So, you yeah. know, it, it's it, it's like you know, I have a friend that just broke their arm and it's been a few weeks and she's in a cast and she's so impatient. When is it going to get better? I'm like, well, everything that's medical generally is measured in three month time periods, right? Yeah. By the time you're done with rehab. Um, and that's the same with disability, with spinal surgeries. Everything is in, measured in many, many months or sometimes a year, you know? And so that that has taught me infinite patience, which is helpful. <laughs> yeah, it's very helpful. And it's Especially very you're dealing necessary. with people, challenging yeah. people. Yeah. yeah, who are typically very impatient. Yes. What technologies do you use to do your job during the day? Um, from a um, tech, uh, from a program perspective, I, my heart and soul is dragon speaking naturally, a uh, dictation mm-hmm. software, uh, yeah. without a doubt. And I have, um, I do, my hands are paralyzed, but I have wrist extension, but I can't, so I can, ri- I can raise my wrists up, but I can't, um, raise them. Um, I can't, um, pick them up wrist flexors. So I can type upside down with my knuckles, but I have a giant, um, Chester Creek easy. It's called like easy eyes keyboard. So, um, like those big yellow with big yellow keys that older folks use. So, or that need enlargement. So I can type with there and I have a, um, Kensington mouse, which is a giant trackball, and I can put both my little paws. That's what I call my paralyzed hands. Mm. And it has two buttons on each side with a big trackball in the middle. And I'm pretty self-sufficient. Um, and I can use most other programs, like most other able-bodied um, folks. I don't have. I've tried the eye gate tracking software. It didn't work for me. I don't really need it. Um, I've tried using Dragon as a function of like as using it as a mouse and going across a screen. That took too long Mm -hmm. um, for me. So, you know, so there are some programs I have uh, problems with, like, for example, um, with Dragon, Microsoft 365 does not play well. They do not play well together. So I have to purchase all standalone um, software programs, which can be expensive, which Mm -hmm. is expensive and can be very challenging. Mm hmm. I understand that there is a 
sale going on through at least Thursday. It's a Labor Day sale from Microsoft. You can get Microsoft Office 2021, the full software package, not 365, but actually the software and have it for 35 bucks, which is interesting. Yeah, I have Office 2019. Um, I have a philosophy. If it's not broken, don't fix it yet. So, Yeah, <laughs> yeah unless there are enough um, new features in the upgrade that make it worthwhile. I'm the same way with iPhones, well, right? Um, yep. I mm -hmm. don't go off and buy a new iPhone just because there's a new one coming out. Exactly. There have to be mm -hmm. not only new features, but new features that I can use that make it worthwhile upgrading unless something really fails in the hardware. Exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. But it is... Uh, it is a challenge. So you, um, so you use though all of that pretty well. I know Josh uses what a puff and sip stick as opposed to being able to do a keyboard. Exactly. Yeah, he has a whole mouse set as well. And what I do as well is I have a laptop, um, and I get a small. It's like eighty dollars. It's a. Uh, um, it's called pluggable. It's a docking station. So ah. I'll plug all my periphery devices into pluggable. I have multiple uh, video cables. I have three screens, I have a keyboard, but then I can just unplug everything very quickly and I can take my laptop and travel. It's, I can use my laptop fine, but it's hard with one screen because I have to click, click clicking. And with a lot of my shoulder challenges, it's a lot of clicking and it really hurts. So for me, the biggest thing in a day from a digital accessibility perspective is how can I reduce the number of keystrokes and the number of clicking I have to do on a website or any document for that matter. Yeah. And they're still not doing a great job of making websites overall, at least from the outset, accessible, which is why companies like Accessibility are making such a big difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There are a lot of companies out there. I mean, digital except that we have a long way to go. Uh, it's do. progress over perfection. And you're never going to make everyone happy and that not one solution is going to fit all. And we also have to be mindful of that as consumers, I think. And also applaud companies that are making an effort and are willing to learn when they get it wrong because no one's going to get it right. We're going to get it wrong all the time. And, but it's about iterating and improving it through AI and very smart individuals. And AI is going to make it and is already making a significant difference. It, it, like anything, can be negative or it can be positive depending on how we deal with it and how we use it. Absolutely. How do we convince people, though, ultimately that being inclusive, like with internet websites, with providing products and the other things to make a, a company and jobs accessible. How do we get people to understand that that really should be and is part of the cost of doing business? I mean, simple education. Well, three words, education, advocacy, and awareness. And it's, it's uh, podcasts and webinars like this and showing people in real time. Because, you know, the thing about human nature is... Just like you have a belief system or a value system, it's very hard to change. And there are a lot of folks I run into all the time like, no, that's not going to work. Didn't you read what happened years ago and that what that company did? Okay, yes. Have you seen the improvements said, yeah. said company have made, has made? And it's showing slowly and being finding people that are open-minded um, to kind of pave the way through that. And you're only going to do that through collaboration and through partnerships, specifically with a lot of community organizations, especially national ones. Yeah. But you have sometimes, you know, sometimes national, I'm part of them. Sometimes national organizations are set in their ways as well. So you have to start at the local chapters and work your way up there. Yeah, it's... Yeah. And usability yeah. testing and inclusive surveys and working um, with, um, you know, an inclusive design and... Um, having diary studies and, and actually doing the research and, 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 and including people with all disabilities in part of the process. Yeah. And there's something that we all need to remember, and that is national organizations, like everything else, is really something that's composed of people and people will be the way they are. And it's about being pleasantly persistent. You keep following up until someone answers you, but you do it with a smile. <laughs> yeah. You got to do it with a smile. You got to yeah. be patient. And it's no uh, different than working with politicians. <laughs> yeah, except that I think they take a, a dumb pill to become politicians. I haven't quite <laughs> figured out when that happens, but they must, you know. I'm pleading the fifth on that one. <laughs> I, I'm still with Mark Twain. Congress is that <gasps> grand old benevolent asylum for the helpless. 
<laughs> so, so yeah, I, I know what you're saying. I've, I have met, however, over the years, some really good, not only well-meaning, but intelligent politicians who really had principles, but they're, they're not as common as one would like. And it's, it's, it's unfortunate, but it's the way the world is. And that's what we got to deal with. Agreed. So we cope. Well, I know you've got things you've got to go do. So I'm not going to prolong this and and make your boss come in and uh, Michael, and we could chat for hours. You. I know we could. Well, we'll have to. We should do another one. I would love to do a follow up. Yes, of course. Count we, me we in. Well, I will. Uh, I will definitely do that. But I want to thank you for being here with us today and taking your time and giving us a lot of good insights. So thank you for that. And I want to thank you all for listening out there. We'd love to hear from you. Feel free to. Well, let me ask you, Allie, how can people reach out to you and maybe contact you if they want to? You know, I think I have my cell phone all over the internet, so you could find me even if I didn't want to be found. (laughs) Um, But I have a website called the Quirky Quad, uh, quirkyquad.com, and it's a Q-U-I-R-K-Y quad.com. You can find me on LinkedIn, Allie Ingersoll, A-L-I Ingersoll, and I'm on uh, Instagram, Allie Ingersoll, Facebook. So pretty much just type it in and I'll pop up somewhere. So you can hunt but her I, down. You can hunt me down. Although I do fight on Google with there's another Allie Ingersoll in Raleigh, North Carolina, who's an investigative reporter. And I know her. So we're, we always joke around fighting on on uh, articles together on Google. <laughs> that sounds like a lot of fun. Yeah, she's great. Spread rumors. There's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> People are yeah. like, Allie, wait, you switched careers again. You're an investigative reporter. I'm like, no, no, that one's not me. Or, or you could just say, well, yeah, didn't you know? I know. <laughs> As the Canadians would say. There you go. Well, thank you all for listening. I hope you'll give us a five-star rating wherever you're listening to us. And if you'd like to reach out to me, I'd love to hear from you. You can reach me at michaelhi at accessibe, A-C-C-E-S-S-I-B-E.com. Or go to our podcast page, www.michaelhingson.com slash podcast. And Hingson is H-I-N-G-S-O-N. So love to hear from you. But Allie, one last time, I want to thank you for being here. And we will do another one of these. We'll schedule it and do it. I would love that, Michael. It's a pleasure. Thank you for having me. I hope everyone listening took one change in perspective, whether it's from Michael, myself, or both of us.